Hi history lovers and welcome or welcome back to the channel where I bring you new videos every week on all aspects of the past. Today on History Calling we're going to look at one of the most famous Tudor jewels ever and certainly one of the most recognisable, Anne Boleyn's bee necklace. This necklace was initially made famous through its appearance in numerous portraits of Henry VIII's second wife but has been kept famous and introduced to many who are new to Tudor history by the presence of copies of it around the necks of many of the actresses who have portrayed Anne on screen. It has also become a cultural phenomenon, with variations of its design appearing in TV shows that ostensibly have nothing to do with Anne and around the necks of models both on and off the catwalk. How much do we know about the real necklace though, and is there any truth to the rumours that it was inherited by Anne's daughter, Elizabeth I, and that parts of it ended up in the English, later British crown jewels, where they still reside today? Please remember to give this video a thumbs up and hit the channel subscribe button. If you switch on all notifications, YouTube will make sure you never miss one of my uploads. If you like my channel's content and wish to support me further, you can also make a one-off donation via the thanks button underneath this or indeed any of my other videos. For this, you'll need to be signed into your Gmail account and donation amounts will appear in your local currency. You'll receive a special one-time animation over the top of my video and the ability to post a personalised, brightly coloured comment underneath it, which will stand out from the other comments. There is, of course, absolutely no expectation or pressure to do this. Anne Boleyn's Bee Necklace, which I would argue is one of the best-known pieces of personal jewellery ever worn by a Queen Consort of England, and probably more recognisable to many of you than some of the modern British crown jewels, was actually a very simple item, though its exact construction is admittedly not clear from the images of it. It appears to have been a rope of rounded pearls, all more or less the same size, looped around her neck to form a choker, with the lower part of the necklace then coming down the front of her neck and décolletage in two parallel strands and disappearing into the neckline of her dress. Suspended from the choker section of the necklace was a golden pendant in the shape of a letter B, though whether it was permanently attached to the necklace or could be quickly hooked on and off once the pearls were in the desired position is unclear. If you look carefully at different images of it, they show it connected to the choker in slightly different ways, sometimes with one attachment, sometimes two. The bee then had three teardrop pearls suspended from its lower bar. No clasp is evident and it is possible that we are actually looking at two separate pearl necklaces, one a choker and one a long string, which have been worn together. Either way, the pearls are augmented by a separate chain comprised of small gold links. The necklace appears in a number of portraits of Anne, which all follow the same pattern, often known as the bee pattern in honour of this piece of jewellery. The best known of these are the two versions held in the National Portrait Gallery in London, one of which you're seeing here on the far left. The other one is pretty cartoonish looking in its quality and has Anne with a lazy eye, which no one ever suggested she had. There is also an all but identical copy to what you're seeing here in the National Portrait Gallery in Ireland. Then there are two versions at Anne's childhood home, Hever Castle in Kent. As you can see, one of these has her holding a rose, the other is dated 1534. Finally, there is a miniature by the artist John Hoskins, which you see on the far right. As I said, these are just the best known of the bee pattern portraits. There are others which I don't have time to go through here and which wouldn't add anything to my discussion of the necklace. The bee pattern always shows Anne wearing the necklace with a black square neck dress and a black French style hood over a gold coif. The neckline of the dress and the habillements of her hood are both trimmed in pearls which match the rope she is wearing. The dress also has golden ouches around the neckline which complement her gold chain. None of the portraits are known to be contemporary to her lifetime and they are thought to be copies of a lost original. Supporting this conclusion is the fact that the British National Portrait Gallery has had dendrochronology tests conducted on the wooden panel the version you see here is painted on, which shows that it cannot date to any earlier than 1584. As for the miniature, John Hoskins wasn't even born until around 1590, and his earliest miniatures date to 1615. 
His portrait of Anne specifically says on its back, though, that it was copied, quote, from an ancient original. We know that in 1590 there was a full-length portrait of her in the possession of Lord Lumley, and that it still existed in a cut-down form in 1773, so it's possible that this was the basis for the bee pattern portraits. Hever Castle has floated the idea that its rose picture, which has until now been dated to about 1550 based on the style in which it was painted, just might be contemporaneous with Anne. However, I'd like to see the results of dendrochronology tests on it before I consider committing to that idea. Do check out the YouTube channel of Dr Owen Emerson though, who is a curator at the castle, for a very enjoyable and well-researched video on this portrait's history. He also puts pay to the idea that the portrait might be of Henry VIII's sister, Mary Tudor, who married first King Louis XII of France and second Charles Brandon, Duke of Suffolk, correctly noting that she was described as having had fair hair by those who saw her and that any initial jewellery she wore to mark her second marriage would have used the letter S for Suffolk, not the letter B for Brandon. I would also add that the lady in the Hever Rose portrait is not wearing a wedding ring, which does not fit with it being Mary Brandon Suffolk during her second marriage. I am therefore confident that this is intended to be an image of Anne Boleyn. Though there are other images, known or purported to be of Anne, the necklace does not appear in them, and crucially there is no documentary evidence describing it either. If it wasn't for the bee pattern portraits, we wouldn't know it had ever existed. Nor do we know where or when she got it, or what age she was when she presumably sat for the original portrait upon which the bee pattern copies are based. The British National Portrait Gallery claims that its painting is based on an original created during Anne's queenship of 1533-36, but there is no source given to prove this date range. Hever Castle's rose portrait is the only one to show her hands, and as noted, she is not wearing a wedding ring, which might suggest that the original portrait, and by extension her ownership of the necklace too, predated her marriage. However, she is holding a red rose, symbolising the Royal House of Lancaster. This would seem a strange thing to do if she wasn't wed to the king yet, but perhaps the original picture dated to their courtship putting it somewhere between 1526 and 1533, and this is why she chose to hold this symbol of Henry's family. It's also possible, particularly given that Hever's version is the only one which includes this detail, that the rose wasn't in the original picture, and was added in by whoever copied it. Then, of course, we have the fact that their 1534 portrait purports to show her when she was married, but doesn't show her hands so that we can't see if there's a ring or not. That said, I don't know when that copy was painted or at what point the inscription with the year was added, so the presence of 1534 on it may signify nothing, as it could have been put on much later. The upshot of all this conflicting evidence is that the bee pattern portraits don't help us to narrow down when or how Anne acquired the necklace. However, we can conjecture from the fact that she opted to wear it in a formal painting that she liked this piece of jewellery and was keen to showcase her Berlin heritage. I'm also confident that we are looking at a real piece of jewellery, rather than something invented just for the painting, because we have records indicating that Anne liked and wore other pieces of monogram jewellery too. Some of these records come from famed court painter Hans Holbein, who was employed by Anne, and indeed Henry, to do more than just draw and paint pictures of them. He also designed jewellery and other ornamental items, and we have drawings he made which show jewels he planned and perhaps even created for the couple. On the left, we can see one example of such a piece, which seems to have been a brooch or pendant with the initials H and A for Henry and Anne and a spot for a precious stone to be placed over the top. On the right, we see A and H again, this time on a shield and joined together by lovers' knots. Inventories of King Henry's possessions, taken in the second half of 1537, also list jewels with clear references to Anne, despite the fact that she was by then dead, and again, in the interest of giving credit where credit's due, I first heard about these drawings and inventories from Dr Emerson's video, though of course I did then go and look up the original sources myself. The inventories included two rings set with diamonds and the letters HA, while another list mentioned ten boxes of jewels, quote, some having the letters HA upon them, and one, a brooch, having the letters RA in diamonds. This would have stood for Regina Anna, or Queen Anne, and can only have belonged to the woman herself, as Henry's initials would have been HR. 
In a similar vein, the only undisputed contemporary image of Anne to survive also shows a version of her regal initials. This is a portrait medal dating to 1534 when she was expecting her second child, a baby she tragically lost that summer. See my video on whether she had a pseudo-pregnancy for more information. It includes the initials AR for Anne the Queen. A bee necklace and indeed the holding of a rose to indicate her connection to Henry are therefore very much in line with what we know of Anne's wider interest in jewellery and the symbolism she liked to have included in images of her. Having established that she almost certainly owned and liked the bee necklace though, we have come to the end of that item's known history and now enter the realms of speculation. Have a look around the internet and you'll come across all kinds of stories about the necklace. One of the most prevalent is that it was kept for Anne's daughter Elizabeth, who later wore it in portraits but with a different pendant attached. This image, painted when Elizabeth was about 12 or 13, is often cited as possibly showing a refashioned bee necklace, though the pearls in this case are interspersed with gold beads, meaning a lot of the pearls would have been removed. Bear in mind though that as this style of necklace is very simple at its core, being just a string of pearls and a pendant, it's easily replicated, and there's not really any reason to suppose that we're looking at the exact same pearls in each portrait. It's not impossible though, and the pendant Elizabeth wears clearly has three teardrop pearls beneath it, just as her mother's bee did. Some internet conspiracy theorists, and people who haven't bothered to do any research, therefore go further and say that these same three pearls were repurposed by Elizabeth and added into the English crown jewels where they remain today as part of the imperial state crown. In fact, you can see one of them in this image of that item. There's zero evidence for this, and it completely ignores the fact that virtually all of the jewels were destroyed or sold by Oliver Cromwell in the mid-17th century, and there's practically nothing left that Elizabeth would have used. For more information about the Imperial State Crown, see my video on the Cullinan Diamond, part of which the crown actually does include. I'll leave it linked on screen and below for you. Another, slightly earlier portrait of Elizabeth is called the Family of Henry VIII. It dates to about 1545, making Elizabeth around 11, and shows her alongside her father, brother Edward, sister Mary, and long since deceased stepmother Jane Seymour, as opposed to her then current stepmother Catherine Parr, who had no children and so was not featured in this picture. If we zoom in, and I know it's blurry, sorry about that, we can see that Elizabeth is again wearing a string of pearls, this time with an A pendant hanging from them. Some have claimed that the necklace must have belonged to Anne and that Elizabeth was making a reference to her mother by wearing it. Author Alison Weir wrote in her book, The Lady in the Tower, that Elizabeth is, quote, wearing astonishingly one of Anne Boleyn's initial pendants, proclaiming to all posterity that she was her mother's daughter. Given that this is mere supposition, I would rather that Weir had not phrased it as an undisputed fact, especially as she effectively gives no source for her information. The paragraph goes on to discuss the famous Checkers ring, which was owned by Elizabeth in later life, and which opens to show tiny portraits of her and a woman assumed by many to be Anne. It contains only one citation, however, right at the end, which is to a book written by writer Jane Dunn. Not only is this not a primary source, Weir also fails to give any page number within this citation, leaving her reader with the prospect of having to wade through Dunn's entire book to try to find the intended reference. Bear in mind too that that reference may well cover only the information regarding the checkers ring rather than saying anything about the necklace Elizabeth wears in the family of Henry VIII portrait. Writing on her website, historian Susanna Lipscomb was a little more circumspect in her treatment of the portrait, musing only that Elizabeth appears to be wearing a pendant A as if in memory of her mother. In other blog entries I read, I found people claiming that perhaps it was a religious symbol and stood for Auspice Maria, meaning under the protection of Mary. Personally, I don't dispute that Elizabeth is wearing an A pendant here, and it's certainly possible that the most obvious answer is the correct one, namely that it was inherited from Anne and was worn in reference to her. However, we simply don't know how to properly interpret it, and there are problems with both the explanations I've discussed here. Auspice Maria seems a strange sentiment for a girl being raised as a Protestant to express. While drawing attention to her disgraced mother in a family portrait with her father, the man who had had Anne killed and who had only just restored Elizabeth to the succession, seems like a dangerous strategy, with no clear benefit for his younger daughter. 
Furthermore, had Elizabeth been trying to snub Henry for some reason, he could have just had the pendant painted out of the picture. The fact that it is still there suggests that either it didn't stand for Anne, or that Henry didn't mind her wearing it for some reason. Weir notes that too, by the way, that Henry's permission would have been needed. Whatever the story behind this necklace is, the pendant clearly isn't the same as Anne's bee necklace. It also has only one pearl beneath it, and there's no way of telling whether the generic-looking string of pearls around Elizabeth's neck is the same as that worn by Anne. This portrait doesn't further our knowledge of the bee necklace. So much for the known and supposed history of the necklace. What about its appearance, or rather the appearance of copies of it, in screen portrayals of Anne? What can they tell us about its historical significance? Having looked back at numerous portrayals of her on the big and small screens, not all of which I have time to go through here, unfortunately, the popularity of the necklace is quickly apparent. Early screen portrayals of her show how famous it already was. For actresses Merle Oberon, Genevieve Bouchold and Charlotte Rampling are shown wearing it in 1933, 1969 and 1972, respectively. This suggests that long before the internet and the rash of TV shows and documentaries we now have about Anne, and when people would only have known what she supposedly looked like by reading books about her or visiting a location which held a portrait of her, the necklace was already an established part of her lore and her image in the popular consciousness. Its fame has continued unabated, and it is rare to find an actress portraying her who doesn't wear a duplicate of this necklace, sometimes to excess in my opinion. Natalie Dormer wore it in the Tudors, but it was used fairly sparingly, and as the story progressed and Anne became the king's mistress, then the queen, thereby gaining access to a much wider array of jewels, she was seen wearing them instead, which made sense to me. By contrast, Judy Turner-Smith wore it so much in Channel 5's show Anne Boleyn that one could have been forgiven for thinking that the Queen had almost no other jewellery, even after having been married to Henry for three years, because this show is set in the first months of 1536. Natalie Portman similarly wore it a little too often for my taste in The Other Boleyn Girl. She was still wearing it in the execution scene, for instance. Again, belying the fact that Anne had an extensive collection of personal jewels, as well as access to the official consort's jewels. Different productions have also taken a different approach to the necklace's appearance. The most important aspect of it is always the pearl choker with the bee pendant, but the additional lines of pearls falling down into her dress and the accompanying gold chain only appear sometimes, and Charlotte Rampling's necklace, despite being the closest to the original of those shown here, has had golden beads interspersed with the pearls in much the same fashion as we saw in Elizabeth's solo portrait. Even the choker and pendant are tweaked sometimes. The teardrop pearls underneath Genevieve Bouchold's bee are set at different lengths, for instance, rather than being in a straight line, and Judy Turner-Smith's bee has no pearls and instead ends in three golden drops. Indeed, the quality of the necklace can arguably be used as an indicator of the kind of budget productions had available to them and how that money was prioritised. Channel 5's production clearly had a much smaller budget available for wardrobe than other movies and TV shows. This is demonstrated, in my opinion, not just by the very simplistic gowns Anne wears, which are almost totally lacking in embellishments and which are no more ornate than anything her ladies-in-waiting are wearing, but by the over-reliance on the bee necklace as a piece of jewellery, the small pearls used within it, and the lack of pearls beneath the bee. Though Natalie Portman sports similarly small pearls in her necklace, this seems to be more of a stylistic choice, given that the overall richness of the costumes throughout the movie was much greater. Its appearance in the Tudors too is interesting, as that show was known for a wide array of beautiful but historically inaccurate costumes, especially for its main female characters, However, an almost perfect copy of the necklace appeared in promotional pictures, though funnily enough the version which made it onto the screen and which you see here on the right was simplified, consisting of just the choker and pendant. The necklace has a life beyond Anne and portrayals of her too. It is so famous that it is now easy to buy duplicates of it, or near duplicates, which replace the initial B with your own. At the time of creating this video, for instance, Historic Royal Palaces sell a version of it with just the choker and pendant, while Amazon have a selection of options to suit a variety of budgets. I'll leave them linked below for you actually in case you're interested. It is clear that it is a popular piece of jewellery too, and it has appeared around the necks of fictional characters and real women with no connection to Anne. 
In the TV show Ugly Betty, the titular character, played by America Ferreira, wears what is clearly a cheap copy of the necklace. By showing that she is unable to afford an expensive version and instead wears a budget knockoff that looks low end, the necklace serves as a storytelling piece, communicating to us the character's lack of wealth and fashion savvy – this is a running joke because she works in fashion – and emphasising her supposed ugliness in contrast to her glamorous work colleagues. I would argue, though, that it is also a nod to the much greater intelligence she possesses compared to them. Her jewellery suggests she is well enough versed in Anne's history to know about the necklace and to connect herself to a woman who was renowned for her fashionable attire and intellect. It's just unfortunate for Betty that her attempt to make this connection is done rather clumsily in the earlier seasons. By the show's end, though, it is styled in a more flattering manner, as is she, and is still present, showing that while Betty has grown as a character, she hasn't lost herself along the way. She's still the girl with the bee necklace. Modernised versions of this necklace have also been seen on the catwalk, including in a Balenciaga 2019 show where the bee was given a makeover in silver and presented on a metal chain rather than pearls. This gave the look a much harder edge. Model Bella Hadid has been photographed wearing her own version of it in her day-to-day -day life too, though she has gone for a more classic design which closely resembles the choker Anne wore. She still layered it with an additional golden chain, though, suggesting that she understands how the original was styled. In each case, the B now stands for something other than Boleyn, but the connection to Anne and the continuing influence of this former queen and her most famous necklace on the fashion zeitgeist are clear. I hope you've enjoyed this deep dive into Anne Boleyn's bee necklace and its historical and cultural significance. Let me know in the comments below what you think might have happened to it, and don't forget to follow me on Instagram. There's a link for that in the description box. If you'd like to learn more about Anne, or if historical fashion and or jewellery are your thing, try one of these videos next. I'll be back next week with a new offering, and until then, keep learning.